You know how some football matches are just intense? Well, the Mackay versus Bremner clash wasn't just a physical rivalry, it was a moment of truth. Mackay had just come back from a broken leg and Billy's vile tackle ruined everything for him. What did Mackay do next? Let's find out in this epic showdown of legends. Let's start with the legends themselves. Dave Mackay, a Scottish powerhouse, known for his strength, leadership and fierce tackling. Playing for clubs like Hearts, Tottenham Hotspur and Derby County, Mackay was a force to be reckoned with on the field. On the other side, we have Billy Bremner, another Scottish dynamo. Known for his fiery temper, skillful play and never-give-up attitude, Bremner made his mark primarily with Leeds United. He was a small guy, but his presence on the field was anything but. There was always tension, but the clash of these two titans reached its peak during the 1960s and 70s when Leeds United and Tottenham Hotspur faced off. But if I keep all the sugarcoating aside, this wasn't just about the teams. It was personal. One of the most iconic moments of this rivalry occurred in a match in 1966. It was a typically fiery encounter, with both sides going all out. During the game, Bremner tackled Mackay hard, leading to a hard confrontation. Mackay, never one to back down, grabbed Bremner by the shirt, lifting him off the ground and glaring at him with pure intensity. This image was captured by photographers and remains one of the most memorable snapshots in football history. Let's go a little deeper, shall we? It was September 20th, 1966, and Tottenham Hotspur was playing against Leeds United at White Hart Lane. The tension was through the roof because these teams were going head-to-head -head in a seriously intense match. From the first whistle, you could tell this game was going to be rough. Players were throwing themselves into tackles and nobody was holding back. It was classic, gritty football at its best, but no one was ready for what was yet to come. In the middle of all this chaos, Billy Bremner, who was known for playing hard, tackled Dave Mackay really aggressively. It was a rough tackle, the kind that makes everyone wince. Mackay, who had been through some nasty injuries before, wasn't going to let this slide. He got up looking absolutely furious and marched right over to Bremner. Without missing a beat, Mackay grabbed Bremner by the shirt with both hands and lifted him off the ground. Yes, you heard that right. He picked him up off the ground. The intensity in Mackay's eyes was something else, and Bremner, despite being lifted up, was staring right back at him, just as defiant. Photographers caught this whole thing on camera, and the picture of Mackay holding Bremner up by his shirt, glaring at him, became iconic. It perfectly captured the fierce rivalry and the raw emotion of that era in football. This photo ended up everywhere, newspapers, magazines, you name it. It became one of those images that people associate with the gritty, passionate football of the 1960s. It wasn't just about the physicality. It was about the sheer passion and pride these players had for the game. Even though this confrontation was intense, the game carried on. Both Mackay and Bremner continued to play hard for their teams, showing just how tough they were. This moment didn't escalate into a full-blown fight, but it definitely left a mark on everyone who saw it. It showed just how much neither of them was willing to back down. But what next? Well, despite their fierce on-field battles, there was a deep mutual respect between Mackay and Bremner. They were both Scotsmen who understood the passion and dedication required to succeed at the highest level. Off the field, they shared a professional respect for each other's abilities and contributions to the game. In fact, after their playing careers ended, they often spoke highly of each other. Mackay once said that Bremner was one of the toughest opponents he ever faced, while Bremner acknowledged Mackay's influence and strength as a player. Not only this, Dave hated it, and here's the proof. Mackay often said, I get asked to autograph that photo all the time, but I don't like it. It makes me look like a bully because I'm bigger than him and I'm lifting him up. But I'm not a bully and I don't like bullies. He had strong feelings about the incident that led to the photo. Bremner was a brilliant player but played dirty. He kicked me right in the leg that I had just recovered from breaking twice. If he had kicked the other leg, maybe I could have shrugged it off. But he didn't, and that really got to me. I was so mad... I felt like I could have unalive him that day. When Mackay wrote his autobiography in 2004, titled The Real Mackay, he chose not to include that famous photograph. And when the Scotsman newspaper featured parts of his book, he was hesitant 
to let them use the image as well. Sir Alex Ferguson, writing in the foreword of the book, captures the emotion behind the incident. He described Mackay's reaction as similar to being inexplicably kicked by a brother or best friend. According to Ferguson, the look on Bremner's face was one of immediate regret for making a foolish mistake. Ferguson made it clear that Mackay was not the type to play dirty or cynically. He loved football too much to do anything that could tarnish its reputation. He wasn't out there to hurt anyone, although he often found himself on the receiving end of rough play from others. So, that was it. But what lessons were learned from this epic showdown? The Mackay vs Bremner rivalry teaches us a few important things. First, it shows how rivalries can really push athletes to do their best. Both Mackay and Bremner used their rivalry as a driving force, helping their teams reach new heights. Second, it underscores the importance of respect in sports. Even though they were fierce competitors, Mackay and Bremner respected each other. This kind of respect helps keep the game fair and enjoyable. Lastly, their rivalry reminds us that football isn't just about winning or losing. It's about the passion, the challenges, and the stories that come with it. The Mackay versus Bremner rivalry adds a rich layer to the history of football, giving us memorable moments that fans cherish. So, where are they now? Sadly, Dave Mackay passed away on March 2nd, 2015, at the age of 80. His death was a big loss for the football world. People remember him not just for being tough on the field, but also for his leadership and incredible skills. After he stopped playing, McKay had a successful career as a manager. He led Derby County to win the first division title in 1975, which was a huge achievement. Even after retiring from playing, he continued to influence football with his coaching and his football philosophy. Not only this, even Billy Bremner passed away on December 7, 1997, just two days before his 55th birthday. His death was a shock and left a huge gap in the hearts of fans and players, Bremner was the heart and soul of Leeds United, and his spirit and drive defined the club during its best years. Bremner's legacy is deeply connected with Leeds United. He led the team to many victories, including two league titles, the FA Cup and a European Cup final. After his playing days, he also managed Leeds United and Doncaster Rovers, though he didn't find the same success as he did on the field. The rivalry between Mackay and Bremner was intense, but it was also built on mutual respect. They are remembered not just for their on-field battles, but for their massive contributions to football. Their legacies live on in the clubs they played for and in the hearts of football fans. Mackay and Bremner showed what it means to play with passion, pride and a strong commitment to their teams. Their fierce battles on the pitch highlighted their competitive spirit, but off the pitch, they respected each other, showing the best side of sports rivalries. In remembering Dave Mackay and Billy Bremner, we celebrate two football giants whose influence and spirit continue to inspire new generations of players and fans. Their stories are an essential part of football history, ensuring their legacies will live on for many years to come. If you enjoyed this story about Mackay versus Bremner and want more deep dives into legendary football moments, make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. Drop a comment below to share your thoughts or suggest another rivalry we should cover next. Let's keep the football spirit alive together. When Kevin Keegan and Billy Bremner faced off, it was more than just a football match. It was a grudge match, a fight of insane anger and passion. But how did this happen? What started this sports war? Let's travel back in time and find out. First up, we have with us Kevin Keegan. Born in 1951 in Doncaster, England, Keegan was a forward known for his lightning speed, incredible skill and goal-scoring abilities. He kicked off his career at Scunthorpe United, but it was his move to Liverpool in 1971 that really put him on the map. At Liverpool, Keegan was a central figure helping the team win multiple league titles and European trophies. Fans loved him not just for his talent, but for his relentless work ethic and determination. Keegan was always giving it his all on the field, and that's why he was such a fan favourite. Now, let's talk about Billy Bremner. Born in 1942 in Stirling, Scotland, Bremner was a fiery midfielder who spent most of his career at Leeds United. He started there in 1959, and by the late 60s, he was the team captain and a key player.
Bremner was known for his aggressive style and fierce determination, earning him respect and fear from opponents. His leadership and combative play were crucial to Leeds' success during that time. Now, if you compare it carefully, Keegan and Bremner's careers took different paths but led them both to greatness. Keegan's creativity and vision made him a star at Liverpool, while Bremner's gritty style and leadership drove Leeds United to victory. But how did they meet? And how did the controversy begin? Well, their paths first crossed in a big way during the 1974 Charity Shield match, which marked the beginning of their famous rivalry. In 1974, the Charity Shield match between Liverpool and Leeds United, which was supposed to be a friendly start to the English football season, turned into an infamous fight. This clash was started by the intense rivalry between the two teams and the fiery personalities of Kevin Keegan and Billy Bremner. The game was already heated with tension, and in the 60th minute things exploded. Keegan, frustrated by Bremner's rough play and constant teasing throughout the match, finally snapped and threw a punch at the Leeds captain. Bremner immediately punched back, leading to a brief but intense fight before the referee, Bob Mathewson, sent both players off the field. As they walked off, the drama only grew worse. Both Keegan and Bremner took off their jerseys in protest, a defiant act that excited the crowd even more. Keegan was visibly furious and continued to shout as he stormed towards the tunnel, and Bremner followed being equally angry. You know, the consequences were serious. The Football Association, FA, handed Keegan a three-match ban and Bremner an eight-match ban, reflecting his role as the instigator. This incident sparked a widespread discussion about player behaviour and how much aggression should be allowed in football. What do you think? Should aggression be allowed? Anyway, the 1974 charity Shield brawl remains a hot topic in English football history. Some people see it as a reflection of the intense rivalry and tough play of that era, while others criticise it as an example of bad sportsmanship. No matter how you look at it, this event created the reputations of Keegan and Bremner as passionate and sometimes hot-headed players. It also intensified the already fierce rivalry between Liverpool and Leeds United, ensuring that future matches between the two teams would be watched with heightened anticipation and a bit of nervousness. Their rivalry was also because of their very different personalities. Keegan, who is known for his flair and sportsmanship, often clashed with Bremner's rough-and-tumble approach. Bremner's aggressive tactics were worlds apart from Keegan's more refined and skillful play, making their matches explosive. Now let's do it. Well, it all starts with how they played the game. Keegan was all about speed, agility and technical skills. He was always moving, looking for ways to score or set up his teammates. With his quick moves and sharp thinking, defenders had a hard time keeping up with him. But Bremner was a different kind of player. He was tough, always up for a challenge, and known for his physicality. His strong tackles and fierce competitiveness defined his style. This big difference in how they played often led to clashes on the field. Not only this, Kevin Keegan and Billy Bremner were like two boxers in the 1970s football scene, always going at it. Bremner, the tough guy, loved to get under Keegan's skin, who usually stayed cool but wasn't afraid to throw a punch back. Their rivalry wasn't just on the field. They were constantly throwing shade at each other in interviews, keeping fans and the media hooked. Their feud even made the rivalry between their teams, Liverpool and Leeds United, even more intense. Back then, both teams were top dogs in English football, always battling it out for the top spot. Keegan and Bremner became the faces of this rivalry, making matches between their teams super exciting to watch, but their dislike for each other went beyond the games. They were always bickering in the media, which kept the rivalry going and gave newspapers and TV shows something juicy to talk about. Speaking of juicy talks, fans loved it when these two fought their cold and hot wars. I mean, the 70s were already a wild time for so many rivalries and controversies going on, but this one specifically was a fan favourite. No matter how hard these two legends tried, fans would still bring up this topic and discuss it with full zeal and enthusiasm. Now, speaking of their careers, Kevin Keegan and Billy Bremner had a rivalry that really shook up their careers. They pushed each other to be the best they could be, which led to some amazing contributions to their teams. Their matches became legendary, often deciding important games and even entire seasons. 
This rivalry was a showcase of their incredible skills and intense competitive spirits. Rivalries like the one between Keegan and Bremner are what make football so thrilling. They stir up strong emotions, drama, and those unexpected twists that fans can't get enough of. These rivalries create stories that people talk about for generations, adding to football's rich history. The excitement and buzz around their matches made each game unforgettable. Later in life, Keegan and Bremner looked back on their rivalry with a lot of respect. They realised that their fierce competition came from their love for the game and their desire to win. Even though they were tough opponents on the field, they respected each other's abilities and achievements. Their rivalry was a big part of their careers and helped them grow as players. The rivalry between Keegan and Bremner is a reminder of the passion football can spark. Rivalries like theirs are essential to the sport, bringing out the emotions, drama and surprises that fans live for. Their competition taught fans the importance of standing up for yourself while also respecting your opponents. It showed that you can compete fiercely and still have respect for each other. Even in the heat of competition, both players had moments of good sportsmanship. Their rivalry showed that you can be very competitive, but still respect your opponent. Their matches taught fans that strong competition and mutual respect can go hand in hand. The rivalry between Keegan and Bremner continues to inspire young footballers today. It shows how far passion and determination can take you. Young players look up to these legends, learning from their dedication, hard work, and the way they handled their rivalry. Their story is a perfect example of how rivalries can drive excellence and inspire greatness. Let us know what you think about them in the comments section below, and don't shy away from giving us more recommendations for upcoming videos. We'd love to hear from you. It was more than just Man United versus Leeds United. It was Law versus Hunter. The legends who played and fought so intensely that their rivalry became a defining moment in English football history. Well, very few rivalries have shined as brightly as the one between Dennis Law and Norman Hunter. These two stars of Manchester United and Leeds United clashed not just in skill, but in determination. Let's relive this rivalry once again. Dennis Law, also known as the king to Manchester United fans, was a star at scoring goals. Born in Scotland in 1940, he became one of the biggest names in football. When he joined Manchester United in 1962, fans loved him right away. He became famous for scoring goals in amazing ways, being really quick and playing tough. Not only this, Law's personality on the field, plus his ability to score when it counted, helped Manchester United win a lot in the 1960s. Now, on the other hand, Norman Hunter, born in 1943, was a tough defender for Leeds United. They called him Bites Your Legs, because of how fiercely he tackled. Hunter started playing for Leeds United in 1962 and became a key player in their defence for a long time. His reputation as a strong player was well earned and his skills in defence were a big part of Leeds United's success. In the beginning, they had nothing to do with each other until one day they became each other's worst on-pitch enemies. Law and Hunter's rivalry was all about the intense competition between their clubs Manchester United and Leeds United. It was fueled by historical, geographical and sporting reasons, making it a fierce and long-standing feud. In the 1960s and 1970s, this rivalry reached its peak as both clubs fought for the top honours in English football. On the field, Law's attacking skills and Hunter's defensive strength often led to direct clashes. These mini-fights were more than just about winning matches, they were about personal pride and proving who was the best. Law's style and Hunter's tough defending created an exciting contest every time they played against each other. One of the most memorable incidents in their rivalry came in a match during the late 1960s. Law, known for his passionate nature, and Hunter, with his aggressive defending, got into a heated argument, Hunter's rough tackles and Law's reactions turned the game into a battle of wills, showing their rivalry and exciting fans. Another very dramatic moment came when Law, frustrated by Hunter's marking and physical play, reportedly said, I'll break your legs. This statement, whether exaggerated or not, showed the intensity and hostility between the two players. Such encounters were not uncommon, though. Every time Manchester United faced Leeds United, 
The clash between Law and Hunter was eagerly anticipated by fans and the media. All these moments are crazy, but not as much as we are right now, because 99% of you are not subscribed to the channel. Kindly subscribe for more such videos and give this one a thumbs up if you liked it. Now back to the video. Now our next question is, could there be any other reason for this rivalry too? Of course, yes. Dennis Law didn't like Norman Hunter for a few reasons. Hunter played tough defence, which made it hard for Law and other attackers to score. Law, who relied on skill and speed, found Hunter's physical style frustrating. They were both very competitive and wanted to win, so they clashed on the field often. The rivalry between their teams, Manchester United and Leeds United, made their personal rivalry even more intense. The fans added to the excitement, howling and shouting and discussing things over and over again. Law and Hunter had very different personalities, which often caused them to clash. Law was flamboyant and charismatic, while Hunter was more serious and tough. Law liked to celebrate goals in a big way, which Hunter didn't appreciate. This led to tension between them both on and off the field. Their rivalry showed how two very different people can compete in football. Despite their differences, both Law and Hunter were incredibly important in football history. Law scored 237 goals for Manchester United, making him one of their best goal scorers ever. He was known for scoring important goals when they were needed most. In 1964, he became the first Scottish player to win the Ballon d'Or, a prestigious award recognising the best player in Europe. Law helped Manchester United win the First Division title twice and the FA Cup once. His skills and achievements made him a legend for the club. On the other hand, Norman Hunter is remembered as a true legend at Leeds United, where he played in over 500 games. His dedication and loyalty to Leeds made him a favourite among fans. Hunter played a key role in Leeds' success, helping them win the First Division title twice. His defensive skills were crucial to the team's achievements. Hunter also played for England, being part of the squad that won the 1966 World Cup, while he didn't play in the final, his inclusion in the squad showed his defensive abilities and leadership qualities. The rivalry between Norman Hunter and Dennis Law is a fascinating part of football history. It was a clash of different styles and personalities, with Law's dislike for Hunter well known. However, their rivalry brought out the best in both players, creating unforgettable moments on the field. Their battles added to the excitement of English football, showing them as legends of the game. So where are they now, and what are they doing? Well, after they hung up their football boots, Norman Hunter and Dennis Law stayed connected to the game in different ways. Norman Hunter, famous for his tough tackles, got into coaching. He started at Barnsley, then moved around coaching at different clubs and even worked with the England national team. He also became a pundit, sharing his insights on TV. Simultaneously, Dennis Law stayed close to Manchester United, where he played a big part of his career. He took on roles as an ambassador and scout for the club, helping to find new talent. He's also been involved in charity work, raising money for cancer research. Sadly, Norman Hunter passed away on April 17, 2020, at 76 years old. He had been battling COVID-19. Hunter was a loved figure in the football community, and his passing was deeply felt by fans, players and clubs alike. Tributes poured in from across the footballing world, with many remembering him not just for his skills on the pitch, but also for his warmth and generosity off it. His former clubs, including Leeds United and Barnsley, paid tribute to him, highlighting his contributions to their respective teams. Now, speaking of their legacy, overall, even today, the stories of Norman Hunter and Dennis Law's clashes are told with so much admiration and nostalgia. Norman Hunter was a defensive powerhouse known for his tough style and leadership. He made a huge impact at Leeds United and for England. Dennis Law, on the other hand, was a brilliant goalscorer, playing for Manchester United and Scotland. Both players were loved by fans for their skills and passion. Their rivalry wasn't just about personal success, it was about pride and respect for their teams. They showed the true spirit of football, inspiring others with their dedication and sportsmanship. 
Even now, people talk about their matches with admiration. They remind us of a time when football was intense and competitive. Norman Hunter and Dennis Law will always be remembered as legends who brought excitement and passion to the game, inspiring players and fans for years to come. And always remember, football is a gentleman's game. Outside of the game, Dennis Law and Norman Hunter respected each other a lot, even though they were rivals on the field. They knew each other's strengths and talents and admired them. Law liked how tough Hunter was in defence, and Hunter respected Law's skill in scoring goals. This respect was not just during games, but also in their lives outside of football. They behaved well and were professional, and this is why the R still loved by everyone. This is why they are legends. When Brian Clough and Don Revy met, it was never just about football. Their rivalry was personal, intense and filled with fireworks. This is the story of two managers who pushed each other to the limit. Brian Clough and Don Revy are two of the biggest names in English football history, famous not just for their managing skills, but also for their violent rivalry. It was a clash in the 70s that should be studied in history books, a one-on-one -on -one that got too much to handle. Starting with our first manager, Don Revy was an English football legend, both as a player and a manager. Born on July 10, 1927, Don's football career started at Leicester City in 1944. He later played for several clubs, including Hull City, Manchester City, Sunderland and finally Leeds United. He was a forward and made quite the name for himself, especially at Manchester City, where he was a key player in the innovative Revy plan. This strategy made him the first deep-lying centre-forward in England, earning him the title of FWA Footballer of the Year in 1955. But it's his time managing Leeds United, starting in 1961, that really put him on the map. When he took over, Leeds was more or less a second division team with no big trophies to their name. Under his leadership, they soared, snagging the first division title twice and the FA Cup once. They even clinched a couple of Intercities Fairs Cups, among other trophies. Leeds turned into a real powerhouse in English football thanks to him. Now, speaking of our second legend, Brian Clough was a big figure in English football, both as a player and as a manager. Born in 1935 in Middlesbrough, England, Clough started his career as a striker, playing mainly for Middlesbrough and Sunderland. He was known for his sharp shooting skills and scored a remarkable 251 goals in 274 matches, which is quite an impressive record. However, Clough's playing career was cut short due to a severe knee injury, but that didn't keep him away from football. He transitioned into management, where he truly made his mark. Clough was a manager who stood out for his strong personality and unique approach. He was outspoken, witty and often controversial, never shy to speak his mind. One of Clough's most significant achievements was with Nottingham Forest. He took over the team when they were in the second division and not only led them to the top flight of English football, but also to back-to-back -back European Cup victories in 1979 and 1980. This was an extraordinary accomplishment, especially for a team of that size and budget. Not only this, Clough's personal life was as colourful as his career. Married to Barbara Glasgow, the couple had three children, and his home life was lively and filled with the same passion he brought to the pitch. So far, so good, right? But in a twist of fate, these two legends became each other's worst enemies. Their story began when both were just players, but it really intensified when they became managers. Revy took charge of Leeds United in 1961 and turned them into a top team, winning many trophies. However, their tough and often harsh playing style made them known as dirty. Brian Clough, who was successful with Derby County, always spoke his mind. He frequently criticised Reeve's methods and the way Leeds played, even calling them cheats many times. His outspoken criticism only made their rivalry stronger. Their conflict reached its height when Clough unexpectedly became the manager of Leeds United in 1974 after Reeve left for the England national team job. It was a challenging situation because Clough had spent years criticising the team he now led. Sadly, Clough's time at Leeds was a failure. He struggled to win over players who were loyal to Revy and couldn't establish his own way of playing. After just 44 days and several bad results, Clough was fired, marking one of the shortest managerial terms in football history, 
But let's rewind a bit to 1972. That's when Brian Clough really stirred things up by calling out Don Revy's Leeds United team. He didn't hold back, labelling them dirty cheats and accusing them of ruining the beautiful game. Revy didn't just sit back, he shot right back at Clough, and before anyone knew it, their professional disagreement had exploded into a full-blown feud. Fast forward to 1974, and Clough lands the Leeds job. You'd think he might smooth things over, but nope, he managed to step on quite a few toes, leading to his exit after just 44 days. And that drama? It just fueled their rivalry even more, with both not missing any chance to throw jabs at each other through the press. Then came Clough's time with Nottingham Forest. Determined to outdo Revy, Clough transformed a struggling team into champions. When Forrest snatched the league title in 1978, just ahead of Leeds by a single point, it must have felt like a personal win for Clough, especially with that fierce rivalry in the background. Throughout the late 70s and early 80s, Clough and Reevy were like night and day. Reevy was the master of meticulous planning, while Clough shone with his bold, impulsive style. Their legendary clashes weren't confined to just the pitch. They spilled over into press rooms and even boardrooms. Despite their fiery exchanges, it's obvious both were brilliant in football. Reevy is known as one of the best managers Leeds ever had, and Clough is praised for changing English football for the better. Their rivalry was more than just arguments. It showed their deep passion and commitment to the game, creating an era that fans still remember fondly today. Now, if you've liked this video so far, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel for more amazing videos. Thanks. Anyways, you know, it's also important to see that Brian Clough and Don Revy were more than just football managers. They were icons who changed the game. Even though they're no longer with us, their legacies still light up the world of football. Don Revy, who we lost back in 1989, is often remembered as the guy who turned Leeds United from an average team into one of the greats during the 60s and 70s. Today, when you see a team playing with tight defence and smart tactics, that's a bit of Revy's influence shining through. Brian Clough, on the other hand, was known for his magnetic personality and a genius for getting teams to punch above their weight. Sadly, he passed away in 2004, but left behind incredible stories of his time with Nottingham Forest, like how he led them to win the European Cup twice in a row, which is something practically unheard of for a club of that size. So, any final words for their rivalry? Well, it's legendary in football, a true battle of giants. Ravi was a master of detailed planning, while Clough took a more daring, bold approach their clash wasn't just about who won or lost games, it was a battle of philosophies, showing us there are many ways to win in football. This rivalry has even made it into movies, books and tons of discussions. It's captured the hearts of both older fans who remember their days and younger ones curious about football legends. For example, the movie The Damned United shows us what happened when Clough tried to step into Revy's shoes at Leeds, which, as I said, was a job he only held for 44 days. But both men faced their share of challenges. Despite his successes, Revy was often criticised for his defensive playing style and later faced allegations of bribery, tarnishing his reputation. Clough's career was a roller coaster of the lasting mark on how football is played and coached. Their stories keep teaching current coaches and players about the importance of leadership and personality in sports. It's like they're still influencing the game, inspiring new generations and sparking debates about what makes a great football manager. All in all, Clough and Revy's impact on football is still felt today. Their stories, lessons and rivalry continue to teach us about passion, innovation and the drive to win, ensuring their legacies will always be remembered. It was supposed to be a match, but it turned into a war zone. The Norman Hunter versus Francis Lee fight is a football legend that's as shocking as it is entertaining. There was drama, there was action, and definitely some serious consequences. Let's live this fight once again. Today, we quite literally present to you a boxing ring with two of the most successful players in football history. I know it sounds odd, but trust the process. Player one is Norman Hunter, born on October 29th, 1943. This man was a real force on the football field. He's best known for his time with Leeds United, where he really left his mark. 
He wasn't just tough, he was also skilled, scoring 21 goals as a centre-back and defensive midfielder. Norman also wore the England jersey 28 times, even scoring a couple of goals. Though he was part of the 1966 World Cup winning team, he didn't play in the tournament itself. He was essentially the understudy to the legendary Bobby Moore. But Norman did scoop up some personal awards. He was the very first player to win the PFA Players Player of the Year in 1974 and got himself on the Football League's list of 100 legends. And that's crazy, right? But wait till I officially introduce our second player. Francis Henry Lee, or Franny as he's often called, was born just a bit after Norman on April 29, 1944. Franny wasn't just a footballer. He was quite the entrepreneur and even chaired Manchester City for a time. Plus, he tried his hand at being a racehorse trainer and played some amateur cricket too. Franny was a phenomenal striker, known for his lightning pace and unstoppable drive. He scored over 200 goals in his career and claimed league championships with both Manchester City and Derby County. He's particularly famous for his penalty kicks, holding the English record for the most penalties scored in a single season. His name was often listed as Lee Won Penn in the match results in the Sunday papers. That's how often he was scoring from the spot. Now in the world of football, we've seen our fair share of scuffles and heated moments, but the fight between Norman Hunter and Francis Lee during a match between Leeds United and Derby County back in 1975 really takes the cake. It was one of those incidents that fans still talk about with a mix of shock and a bit of a chuckle. Norman Hunter, a tough-as-nails defender for Leeds United, and Francis Lee, a feisty forward for Derby County, were no strangers to the rough and tumble of English football. Both players were well known for their aggressive play, but on this particular day their competitiveness boiled over into an outright fistfight. The match itself was pretty tense, with both teams fighting hard to climb up the league table. Tackles were flying, the crowd was roaring and the pressure was mounting. And then finally came the moment that everyone remembers. Lee and Hunter had been nipping at each other's heels all game, throwing little jabs and shoves. Things really heated up when Hunter tackled Lee a bit too hard. Lee didn't take it lightly and hit back. Before anyone knew it, they were both throwing punches right in the middle of the pitch. It wasn't just some minor shoving. It turned into a full-blown fight with actual punches. The referee tried to calm things down and ended up giving both of them red cards. But even as they were leaving the field, they kept yelling at each other, like they were ready to go for another round. But that wasn't the end of it. They also faced some more serious consequences. The Football Association, or FA for short, was not happy about the fight because it looked bad for the sport. They decided to fine both players. While we don't know the exact amounts, these fines usually ranged from a few hundred to a few thousand pounds. On top of the fines, Hunter and Lee were also suspended from playing for several matches. This kind of suspension is the FA's way of saying, if you mess up, you're going to miss out on playing, which is a big deal for any player. What's kind of funny, or maybe just surprising, is the way the crowd reacted. You might think people would be shocked or upset, but nope, everyone was up on their feet, cheering and yelling like they were watching a boxing match, not a football game. Speaking of cheering and yelling, we hope you liked this video so far, and if you actually did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more such amazing nostalgic videos. Now back to the fight. After everything cooled down, both Hunter and Lee got hit with fines and suspensions. The media went wild with the story. It was all over the newspapers. This fight ended up being one of those notorious moments that really showed how intense rivalries were in 1970s football. Years later, Hunter looked back on that day and admitted he wasn't proud of it, especially since he liked playing against Lee. Talking to TalkSport, Hunter said, There were some players I didn't like facing, but I actually enjoyed playing against Franny. That incident? Definitely not my best moment. Turns out... He really thought Lee was a great guy. Years after their big fight, Hunter shared a funny memory. One day he ran into Lee again, who was now the chairman of Manchester City. As they met at the top of some steps, Hunter braced himself, half expecting trouble. But Lee just grinned and joked, Let's go in that boardroom and finish that fight. It was a funny way to remember their old clash, showing all was well between them. Even years after they retired, 
their respect for each other was obvious. Sadly, Norman Hunter died due to complications from COVID-19. He was being treated in hospital when he passed away. Leeds United and many fans expressed their sorrow and paid tributes to him. They remembered him, not just as a fantastic player, but also as a great person off the field. When Hunter passed away in April 2020, Lee expressed his sadness on Twitter. He wrote, So sad to hear about Norman Hunter, a great defender and a wonderful person. He was loved and admired by everyone who knew him. Rest in peace. Lee's tweet showed he really respected Hunter, despite their tough times on the field. Just three years later, Lee lost his long battle with cancer. When Francis Lee was diagnosed with cancer, it came as a shock to everyone who loved football. Throughout his illness, the community came together to support him, showing just how much he was respected and loved. Francis fought his illness with the same toughness he showed on the football field, but sadly, he couldn't beat this tough battle. His passing has left a big hole in the hearts of those who knew him and those who admired him from a distance. As we grieve his loss, we also celebrate his life and the amazing mark he left on the world of football. Francis Lee will always be remembered not just for his achievements on the field, but for his bravery, kindness and true love for the game. All in all, the famous fight between Norman Hunter and Francis Lee was more than just a moment of conflict on the football field. It became a symbol of the intense competitiveness and deep respect that defined English football in the 1970s. Even though they exchanged punches and faced penalties, what really stands out is how their respect for each other grew over time. Fans remember not just the fight, but also the impressive careers and personal growth of both players. They went from being fierce rivals to respected figures in the sport, influencing not just games, but people. When they passed away, the tributes poured in from all over, showing just how much they were loved and admired, both on and off the field. This story isn't just about a fight, it's about how rivalry turned into respect and left a lasting legacy in football. Let us know in the comments what you think about these legends, and also, tell us who would you want us to cover next. Two legends, one question, who was better, Kevin Keegan or Mick Channon? Let's settle this debate with a head-to-head -head showdown and see who comes out on top. The 1970s was a crazy time for football, with so many legendary players lighting up the pitch. Even if they weren't real rivals or enemies, fans and pundits loved comparing them. Two such legends were Kevin Keegan and Mick Channon, who have the entire football world talking about which one is better. To start off things, Kevin Keegan, also known as King Kev, was a huge name in English football. Born in 1951, his love for the game started very early on. His uncle gave him his first football and his dad bought him his first boots after a lucky win at a race. That's how his football journey began. At just 15, Keegan left school for an office job where he joked about making more tea than working that corporate job. But you know, football was his true passion and that's why he kept playing. He played for many local teams until he got a trial at Scunthorpe United where he earned a professional contract. Keegan became a star at Scunthorpe catching the eye of Liverpool's scout in 1971. Without wasting any time, Liverpool made an offer and Keegan moved there as a midfielder. But his attacking style impressed the manager so much that he turned him into a striker. Also, what's very interesting is that in the 72-73 season, Keegan's goal against Leeds helped Liverpool win the first division title, their first major trophy in years. The next season, he led Liverpool to an FA Cup win. So, it's safe to say, Keegan's success continued, helping Liverpool secure the league and UEFA Cup titles. On the other hand, born on November 28, 1948 in Wiltshire, England, Mick Channon was also a huge football fan right from the start. He was super talented, and the scouts from Southampton FC noticed him very early on. When Mick started playing for Southampton, he was like lightning on the field. He was really fast and had a knack for scoring goals. People called him a goal-scoring machine because he just couldn't stop scoring. Mick's debut in 1966 marked the beginning of something special. He was so quick that defenders had a hard time keeping up with him. Plus, he had this amazing ability to find the goal almost instinctively. His talent didn't go unnoticed, and soon Mick was playing for the England national team, 
showcasing his skills to the whole country. During his time with Southampton, Mick played in over 500 games and scored more than 200 goals, making him one of the club's top goalscorers ever. He also played for England, earning 46 caps and scoring 21 goals. Mick became really famous in English football and is remembered as one of the greatest players. But when it comes to comparison, both Mick Channon and Kevin Keegan's football careers were very interesting. If we statistically speak, then Kevin Keegan was a big star for England, playing 63 times and scoring 21 goals. Even though he was really good, his time with England had some close calls and missed chances, especially during the 1980 European Championship and the 1982 World Cup qualifiers. Mick Channon, on the other hand, also had a great run, playing 46 times and scoring 21 goals. He was part of the team during the 1974 and 1978 World Cup qualifiers, which is great. But according to most fans, Kevin gets a point here. Coming to our next parameter, let's talk a thing or two about their personalities. Well, Keegan was very well known for his energy and versatility. He could play as a forward or midfielder and always gave 100%. Fans loved his leadership and hard work. Also, his vibrant personality matched his playing style and made him very popular. He was humble and dedicated, and after retiring, he managed teams like Newcastle United and Fulham. Plus, he had a big personality and went on to become a successful manager. On the other hand, Channon was a traditional forward with a real talent for scoring. His windmill goal celebration became famous. Besides scoring, he was great at holding up play and creating chances for his teammates. Fans really enjoyed his creativity and technical skills. Also, after his football career, he became a successful racehorse trainer, showing his love for sports. But his life wasn't free from trauma and controversies. Everything was going great for Mick until one day in August 2008. He was driving home with his son Jack and their friend Tim when they had a terrible accident. Tim died and Mick and Jack were badly hurt. Mick's heart ached even more than his body. He felt so guilty and kept asking himself if he could have done anything to prevent the accident. It took a long time for him to heal, both physically and emotionally. When he went back to training horses, things just weren't the same. He couldn't feel happy anymore even when he won races. The memories of that awful day were always there. Overall, Mick became quieter and more reserved. He didn't laugh or smile as much as he used to but he found comfort in watching young footballers play. So who was better, Kevin Keegan or Mick Channon? It's a tough choice and depends on what you like in a player. Keegan had a lot of team success and personal awards, while Channon's loyalty and consistent goal scoring made him a legend at Southampton. If you like charisma, versatility and international fame, Keegan might be your pick. His impact on Liverpool and his later career as a manager highlight his importance to English football. But if you appreciate loyalty, consistency and goal scoring, Channon stands out. His dedication to Southampton and his forward skills make him the most loved figure in English football history. Now, before we go any deeper, please make sure to give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more such updates. Thank you. As of today, Kevin Keegan is chilling in retirement now. After his playing days, he tried his hand at managing teams. These days, he's more into charity work and popping up on TV now and then. Similarly, Mick Channon is also done with kicking the ball around. But instead of football, he found a new love in horse racing. He's a successful horse trainer, winning big races like the Royal Ascot and Cheltenham Festival. He's still deeply into horse racing, living his best life after football. Speaking of best life, their legacy is wild. Kevin Keegan and Mick Channon both left a huge mark on football that's still felt today. Keegan, with his amazing skills and passion for the game, inspired a generation of players and fans. Mick Channon, on the other hand, showed that footballers can excel in other fields too. His switch to horse racing was a surprise to many, but he proved that with determination and talent, you can succeed in anything you love. Both Keegan and Channon's legacy goes beyond their playing days. They showed that football is more than just a game, it's a passion that can lead to amazing opportunities. Their impact on football is still remembered and celebrated by fans worldwide. 
they continue to inspire future generations of footballers and show that with hard work and dedication, anything is possible in the world of sports. In the end, both players brought something special to the game. Keegan shone on bigger stages and won more trophies, while Channon's love for Southampton and his scoring record make him a hero for the Saints. This debate might never have an exact answer, but one thing is clear. Both Keegan and Channon are legends who enjoyed the beautiful game with their talent and passion. What do you think? Do you like Keegan's versatility and flair, or Channon's consistency and loyalty? Let us know in the comment section below. All in all, the beauty of football is in these debates, and whichever side you choose, it's clear both players left an unforgettable legacy. They are both legends. Bobby and Jack Charlton touched the skies as football icons. Behind the World Cups and the Ballon d'Ors and the shiny Charlton name, the brothers could not breathe the same air. The reason, when you will get to know, will take you aback. In the annals of English football, few names resonate with as much glory and admiration as the Charlton brothers, Bobby and Jack. Both carved out illustrious careers on the pitch, becoming icons in their own right. But behind the scenes, a simmering rivalry brewed, threatening to overshadow their achievements. Imagine growing up in Ashington, a village where coal mining was the heartbeat of the economy. For the Charlton family, football was in their blood, but their father, Bob, was a miner. Despite the financial challenges, the family's love for football ran deep. Bobby, Gordon, Tommy and Jack, the four brothers, shared a bed due to tight finances. The northeastern winters were so cold that the brothers would argue over who slept in the warmest middle spot of their double bed in what was two-up, two-down accommodation. Their mother, Sissy, played football with them and even coached the local school's team. She was the driving force behind their early football exposure, taking them to watch matches of Ashington and Newcastle United, which ignited Bobby and Jack's lifelong passion for the game. It's fascinating how Sissy's love for football influenced her sons, leading Bobby to become a dedicated Newcastle supporter throughout his life. At just 15, Bobby was offered a trial at Leeds United, where his uncle Jim played, but he initially chose to join his father in the mines. The harsh reality of working underground soon led him to reconsider, and he applied to join the police force. However, his passion for football never waned. When the opportunity for a trial at Leeds United arose again, Bobby seized it, even if it meant missing a police interview. His decision to pursue football over mining or law enforcement shaped his future and ultimately led him to iconic moments on the pitch. Similarly, Jack's early life mirrored Bobby's in many ways. Raised in the same coal mining village by parents deeply rooted in football, Jack was exposed to the sport from a young age. Despite the initial offer of a trial at Leeds United, he too briefly worked in the mines before choosing to follow his football dreams. The Charlton brothers' journey from the coal mines of Ashington to the pinnacle of football exemplifies the impact of family support, perseverance and a shared love for the beautiful game. From their humble beginnings in the mining towns of Northumberland to the grand stages of Wembley and beyond, their paths intertwined, yet their relationship remained fraught with tension. The Charlton brothers were polar opposites in many ways. Bobby, the elegant playmaker, blessed with sublime skill and vision. Jack, the no-nonsense defender, renowned for his toughness and resilience. Their contrasting styles mirrored their personalities, creating a clash of egos that fueled their on-field rivalry. Bobby Charlton and Jack Charlton, born in Ashington, Northumberland, had a childhood deeply rooted in football. Their father, Bob Charlton Sr., who was a former professional footballer, played a significant role in fostering their love for the game. Growing up in a football-centric family, the brothers spent their early years playing football together in the streets and fields of Ashington, honing their skills and competitiveness. Bobby joined Manchester United's youth system as a teenager. He made his first team debut for Manchester United in 1956, establishing himself as one of the club's greatest players. His attacking prowess and midfield brilliance would later see him represent England at the highest level, playing a pivotal role in England's World Cup triumph in 1966 and earning accolades such as the Ballon d'Or. Meanwhile, Jack Charlton, younger than Bobby, 
also developed a passion for football early on. He was introduced to the sport by his father and played for local youth teams in Ashington before joining Leeds United as a young player in the early 1950s. Jack's physical presence and defensive abilities made him a formidable defender for Leeds United, contributing significantly to the team's successes during his career. Their shared early experiences and dedication to the game showcase the impact of their football-centric upbringing in shaping their illustrious careers. Bobby Charlton was a crucial member of the England national team that won the FIFA World Cup in 1966. He played a key role in England's success, scoring crucial goals throughout the tournament. Charlton spent most of his club career at Manchester United. He made 758 appearances for the club and scored 249 goals, making him one of the greatest players in the club's history. Bobby was part of the Manchester United team that won the European Cup in 1968. He played a vital role in the final, scoring two goals against Benfica. In recognition of his exceptional performances, Bobby won the Ballon d'Or in 1966. He was the first English player to receive this prestigious award. The Munich air disaster of 1958 was a tragic event that deeply impacted Bobby Charlton and Manchester United as a whole. Bobby was on board the plane along with his teammates and staff, returning from a European Cup match. The weather conditions were deteriorating, and after two aborted takeoff attempts due to technical issues and worsening snow, the passengers were advised to disembark temporarily. During this time, Bobby and his teammate Dennis Violet made a fateful decision to swap seats with Tommy Taylor and David Pegg, moving closer to the front of the plane. This decision would later save Bobby's life, as the plane tragically crashed during its next takeoff attempt. The impact tore the aircraft apart, claiming the lives of several passengers, including members of the Manchester United team. Bobby Charlton, though injured with cuts and severe shock, miraculously survived the crash. His teammate Harry Gregg played a crucial role in rescuing Bobby and others from the wreckage, dragging them away from the plane in fear of an explosion. Despite the trauma and loss, Bobby emerged from the hospital after a week, the first injured survivor to do so. In his autobiography, Jack said that, Bobby was never the same lad to me after Munich. I saw a big change in our kid. He stopped smiling. He won the FA Cup with Manchester United in 1963, contributing significantly to the team's success. Charlton has been inducted into multiple football halls of fame, including the English Football Hall of Fame and the FIFA 100 list of the world's greatest living players. Beyond his playing career, Charlton has been involved in various charitable activities, including his work as a patron of the Manchester United Foundation and involvement in humanitarian causes. Jack Charlton was a key player in the England national team that won the FIFA World Cup in 1966, alongside his brother Bobby. He was a towering presence in defence and played a crucial role in England's success. He spent the majority of his club career at Leeds United, where he became a club legend. He made 629 appearances for Leeds and played a vital role in the team's successes during the 1960s and early 1970s. Jack won multiple First Division titles with Leeds United, including the 1968-69 and 1973-74 seasons, establishing himself as one of the top defenders of his era. He was part of the Leeds United team that won the FA Cup in 1972, adding to his list of domestic honours. Charlton played in the European Cup final with Leeds United in 1975, although they were runners-up to Bayern Munich. After retiring as a player, Jack had a successful career as a manager. His most notable achievement was leading the Republic of Ireland national team to unprecedented success during his tenure from 1986 to 1996. Under Charlton's management, the Republic of Ireland qualified for their first major international tournaments, reaching the quarter-finals of the 1988 UEFA European Championship and the quarter-finals of the 1990 FIFA World Cup. The Charlton boys, who were paraded around Ashington when they returned after winning the World Cup together, never bonded in childhood. Jack was an outdoor type who resented having to watch out for his younger, home-loving sibling. There was never any definitive conclusion as to why the two drifted so far apart, but Bobby's 2007 autobiography suggested that the rift was sparked by Jack's wife Norma's strained relationship with his mother Cassie. 
Because his wife Norma was not willing to have a relationship with Cassie, the boy's mother, Bobby also did not bother much to stay in contact with his mother. Eleven years earlier, Jack had criticised Bobby for failing to visit Cassie in her final years and suggesting that had been influenced by Norma. Bobby responded in his book, My wife is a very strong character and does not suffer fools gladly. I'm not suggesting my mother was a fool, he added. There was a clash and it just never went away, really. Jack came out in the newspapers saying things about my wife that were absolutely disgraceful. Nonsense. Bobby added he and his brother had never been further apart than we are now before going even further to say, I just don't want to know him. It was a feud that lasted over four decades and had shown no signs of abating, with neither making an apology. The actual matter was actually much deeper than the wife and mother melodrama. The two brothers had to spend a lot of time together as kids. No one liked that. Then they entered the same field and became a part of the same team. And that way, a professional rivalry also made a heavy place. Divided by family discord in their post-playing lives, they were united by one terrible detail of their twilight years. Both succumbed to dementia and spent their final months in the shadowland of pain and memory loss. Yet that all changed once, in 2008. It was one key defining moment in their stories, when the BBC Sports Personality of the Year Award. Bobby Charlton won the Lifetime Achievement Award, which was presented to him by his brother Jack Charlton. Jack said these memorable words on stage, Bobby Charlton is the greatest player I've ever seen, he said. He's my brother. And then both brothers embraced each other for quite some time, which was an emotional moment for Charlton fans. They had grown up into senior citizens, but the rivalry, the resentment that began in childhood, when they were only in the beginning years of life, that emotion kept growing inside their hearts. That rivalry was probably the reason each one of them tried to outrun the other sibling, but it also made them stay far from each other. Bobby might have his side of the story and Jack had his, but they never got to communicate that with each other, and probably that was where it all went wrong. While Bobby's two-footed creative skills have come to be revered all over the world, Jack was an aggressive, uncompromising and physical defender, and both are loved for different reasons by soccer fans till today, regardless of what made those two hate each other for so long.